All right. It sounds like everyone got into a good conversation. Welcome again. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to connect with some of you today after the service. So like Adobe said, if you're just, you know, you've been around for the first time today or just a little while, please join us in the courtyard. And if anyone is interested in covenant membership, I would just love a chance to get to connect with you all today. And it's beautiful outside. Praise Jesus. Just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. All right. Uh, Chris is here, and he's going to read our scripture for today. We're in a conversation called Jesus-Centered Church, and we're talking through the book of Ephesians. And so we thought, why don't we hear some voices from our church, not always just mine. And so Chris is going to read our passage for today before we jump into the scripture together in Ephesians 3. Go ahead, Chris. For this reason, I, Paul... The prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations It has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable reaches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Thanks for reading that, Chris. What I love about this is this is how people would have first heard these words from Paul, although it wouldn't have been in English, obviously, 2,000 years ago. Uh, but they would have listened. Most of the faith communities weren't, were primarily people who didn't read, and so these would be read aloud, and so that's why we've been doing that. Did you catch our community time question in there? Uh, mystery. Three times in just those first few verses of chapter 3, uh, mystery is brought up. Now, I am someone who can enjoy a good mystery story, but I am not open to the ones where someone's going to jump out at you at any second. See, I know this. Who are you people that are like, I love watching movies to feel anxious the whole time? (laughs) Are you not, like, paying attention to the world? I don't know. Or it's it's escaping into another story, right? Okay, I get that. I'm with that. I'm for that. But I can't do it. I can't do the jumping around the corner thing, but I love a good mystery, Because I love wondering what's going to happen at the end, and I love how it makes me think, right? Like thinking about what is it, how is this going to happen, what, and and when there's a totally unexpected uh, ending, you know it's a good writer when there's an unexpected ending to a book or to a movie or to a TV show where you're thinking, oh, I never would have seen that coming. I think God is that kind of writer, (laughs) God is the kind of writer of the story of God that we're joining in, where God is constantly being surprising us, right, and saying, whoa, I'm living this story, and I think, God, I never would have seen that coming. There's unexpected twists and turns, and of course, we know in our life, sometimes those are good, sometimes those are hard, and sometimes those are just plain surprising, and sometimes they jump out at you, like, look, you know, like I was saying, I didn't love before. But I think there's so many unexpected twists and turns in the plot when it comes to the story of God that we're joining into in our lives today. Things where I just never would have seen it coming. And so when you think about even our church, some of you have been around like Mitch since the beginning, 14 years. There have been so many unexpected things that have happened in the life of our church. I remember in 2008 when some of us were gathering together, maybe like 30 people, 
It never would have been in the strategic plan that someday we would help launch one of the largest nonprofits to feed hungry kids in the state, right? I mean, that's amazing. Like, what, God, more of those cool twists and turns, right? Like, we never would have expected that. There's also been some really tough ones in our church life, right? Everyone else together, we're all in how unexpected a couple years ago was, right? We were not seeing, no one saw that coming in the way that it happened. Now, what ended up happening for us here at Mill City, I remember it was like Thursday or Friday when they declared COVID a pandemic in the, in the world. And we got an email that day from this school, Las Estrellas, saying your lease is, is indefinitely on hold, Okay. Does anybody who was there, I mean, does anybody remember, this is a pop quiz, how many Sundays we were not here at Las Estrellas? Does anybody know? How many Sundays were we out? 65? 72! There it is, Mitch, Papa, right there. (laughs) 72 Sundays where we couldn't be here to worship and praise God for the brand new event center Quincy Hall because we were able to be there to worship together but we were so excited to come back we never would have seen that coming well we are in another part of the story of this church where I would suggest we would not have seen it coming and I want to spend just a little bit of my time today talking about something that we shared over email this week with many of you and online and that is this this process that we didn't see coming an invitation to discern what is called an adoption merger with a church that we love down the street, Elam Church, just six blocks from here. Um, We have all this stuff online, so you can read about it, but let me just give you the brief information. And maybe there's some people from Elam here today. I invited them to come whenever they want. Come join us. Um, Elam has been one of our church partners for a long time. And so this invitation to consider an adoption merger, what that really is, is this idea of, is God calling us to welcome Elam Church into Mill City Church? That's where the adoption, the family part, right? Like welcoming into the Mill City family. And what we always talk about here at Mill City is there's only one church of Jesus that just meets in different locations. So it's kind of a big question to say, should these two local churches be one? This is an example of one of those mysteries, is it not? Where you're like, could I know the answer to that? Could I just see the future, please? I, for one, am very curious about what God might be doing here. But the truth is, we don't yet know what the outcome is going to be. It is a mystery. Um, But let me give you just a little bit more context. Elam was originally a Swedish-speaking immigrant church that started in 1888. Someone was like, she misspoke. Not 1988, 1888. This was a a community of people similar to our Spanish-speaking church plant, Espiritu Santo. They wanted to worship God in their heart language. And at that time, for that immigrant community, it was Swedish. And so they gathered together and they formed this church that's now called Elam. Now, Mill City started in 2008, and so that is about a 120-year difference. Elam has, over these last few years, experienced some decline. It's 134 years old. Many churches experience that because churches are like life, have a life cycle. Mill City Church has a life cycle too. Elam has had multiple amazing life cycles in its life, but they're at this critical juncture right now because this decline was exasperated by the unexpected last couple of years of this pandemic, and this affected so many things in the world today. And so they're at what I would call like a critical juncture in their life as a church, And they surprised us and approached us with a question. And the question was, would we consider adopting them? And that would mean their people, their resources, would essentially join in and be a part of Mill City Church. And they wondered if we might be better together than as two separate churches. So if you're hearing about this for the first time, whoa, right? If you've been thinking about it for just a little bit, let me just invite you to think about this. Try to stop and think about how much courage and humility and trust in Jesus it took for them to even start this conversation with us. Just think about that. They have a 134-year legacy that's at stake here. But you know what else they have? They have 134 years of seeing God move through their church. They have had generations of folks who have been trying to love the Northeast Minneapolis community in the name of Jesus. So I've noticed as I've gotten to know the Elam community over the last 14 years that there is some people that have this unshakable faith that comes from seeing God's faithfulness for decades upon decades upon decades. Elam's a multi-generational, Jesus-focused church, and they're trying, they're looking down the street six blocks and they're going, well, there's a multi-generational Jesus-centered church. And they approached us to say, hey, one difference that we see is that in Mill City's life cycle, it's a time of momentum and growth. And could God be inviting us to be better together? 
So just recognize, please, with me, what courage it took for those folks to enter in and to say, this is a courageous step for us to invite you to pray about this with us. It, right now, it's just a discernment. Knowing that it would bring change, that it would bring grief, but knowing that it could mean a new future, a legacy that's an ad adopted and a, and a bright future for what God might be doing. So there's a lot more that I could say here, and I'm not going to take much more time for that, but please know we want to be as transparent as possible. We've got information online. If you go to millcitychurch.com slash blog, that's where we have blogs that we're going to put out. We'll make sure that we put as much information there as possible because we want you to join in. We want to get your feedback. We want to hear what you think because the leaders of both churches believe that the future of our churches is in you all. We mean this. There is not an answer that's going to be given to me or just a small group of leaders. We're going to hear this from all of us together, and we, we really mean that as a church. That's how we function on big decisions like this. So the leaders are asking the question right now, is this feasible? And if the answer is yes, it's feasible, uh, then after this week we're going to meet and we're going to say, okay, it's time to ask the question, is this what God's doing? And we've been there before, haven't we? <laughs> asking the question, is this what God's doing? And so we're wanting you to join into that. We're going to have lots of updates. If you're on our email list, we will keep you updated. But one of the first invites is that we have been invited to host a Mill City worship night at Elam's building, like I said, six blocks from here, on Sunday the 16th in the evening at 6.30 p.m. Would you consider coming and joining us for that? It'll be an experience of discernment to be able to just imagine as we step in and we worship in this beautiful space, inviting the Holy Spirit to meet us there as the Holy Spirit has done for 100 years for that community. And so please consider joining us in that. We're going to keep you updated on the blog. So like I said, mysterious. God is a God that writes a story that has unexpected turns and twists in the plot mysterious. I sat down with one of our founding members, Stacey May, and I said, you know, hey, this is what, what the Elam community has invited us into. What do you think? And she said, well, it sounds like Mill City. We never see things coming, and then God's like, here you go. Pray about it, and we've got to trust God to figure out what to do. It's a mystery, all that God might do through all of this, just like all the unexpected things that God has done in our church in the past. And I think that I am somebody who, just like anyone else, wishes that certainty was an option, Oh man, I just wish that it was. I wish I could know the future. I wish I could know. I don't think I probably really want to know. But I wish that I could sometimes. But the truth is, is that a life of faith is a life of mystery. It's a life of being willing to accept the unknown, but to know that there is a God who can be known. The life of faith is one where there's a God who very much can be known, but also a God who is so great that our finite minds could never fully comprehend all that God has done, all that God is doing, and all that God will do. Amen? That's the reality of faith. And so in, in the, 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 the world of faith, we often talk about this theological concept of the mystery of God. Maybe you haven't heard about it before, but you hear Paul talking about it here in what Chris read. The mystery of God. Look at this definition. In Greek, it's mysterion, and you see it throughout Paul's letters. You see it three times here in these verses. This is the best way I could describe it. The mystery of God is what God knows and understands fully that humans can only know in part. And humans only get to know it in part when God reveals it to them. All right, you see what I'm saying? So when God knows, God knows all things, right? God is omniscient and God knows all things. And, and the mystery of God is all that God knows that we don't understand, but that sometimes God reveals the mysteries to God's people, which is incredible. One commentary put it this way. The content of the divine mystery is painted in broad strokes in the Old Testament. It takes on greater detail throughout the Gospels. And then it receives its final finishing touches in Paul's letters. So here we are in Ephesians where we see the finishing touches on this theology of the mystery of God. Of course, there's more I could say there, but let's look at this together. In Ephesians, we see Paul, this early leader in the church in the first century, writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. But what we now know is that letter did not stay in Ephesus. It traveled all over the ancient Near East and went to so many different churches where it was read aloud and people heard from Paul's heart as a pastor and as a leader who loved them. I would say this is an example of going viral in the first century, all right? This letter went all over the place. And Paul is writing this letter very obviously in the beginning. He says he's writing the letter while he's in prison in Rome. Why is he in prison? Because he invited some Gentiles, the ethnic group that is usually considered outsiders, into a space that had been designed only for Jewish community to worship. And long story, he ended up in prison for that. 
In this part of the letter that Chris read, Paul is helping the early church hearers. hearers, They are going to grasp that God has revealed a mystery to them. Now, this would have been a big deal, right? You usually have to be somebody special to think that God would reveal something to you. And Paul here is saying, I'm not special. In verse 8, I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people. And if you know Paul's backstory, you know why he said that. Because he had been a violent person. And until Jesus captivated his heart, he was putting violence towards people who followed Jesus. And then Jesus captivated his heart and he became a follower of Jesus. So Paul, who is less than the least of the Lord's people, is excited to remind the rest of the Lord's people that God has revealed a huge aspect of the mystery of God to them. It's a huge deal. They can be in on the mystery. And I'm just going to see it summarized here in verse 4. Here's the summary of the mystery that they're welcomed into starting in in chapter 3, verse 4. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, it, it is important for us to recognize here that this is a big deal. We don't know the tone of voice that Paul had, but most scholars say this was a passionate speech he was given. You could tell by the way it was written. And there in verse 5, he's saying, this wasn't made known to previous generations. We're the generation that gets this mystery revealed to us. What a great time to be alive. The guy's in prison. What a great time to be alive. God's revealing something incredible to us, and it could be so easily lost on us here in 2022 how big of a reveal this would be. These two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, had been more than just like not friends, right? They were more than just people who didn't share the same interests. They weren't in the li- not the same life stage. They weren't from different generations. These were two different groups of people with very different ethnic backgrounds who were considered enemies. Enemies. And, and here... We just need to stop and say, before we pick on them, let's just have a moment to recognize the divisiveness in which we live. So let's not pick on the Jews and Gentiles for this. But God has done something amazing. This is what Paul is saying. In verse 6, the mystery is that through the Gospels, the Gentiles are heirs equally with Israel, or the Jewish community. When you say Israel, that's what it means. Members together, not just together, but separate, but of one body. This is huge. They're sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. This future hope that we get to live with Jesus forever when he comes to return and to make all the wrong things right. This was miracle territory. Just get our heads around this. As far as they had experienced it, this was miracle territory. We're talking about radical unity in diversity where there had once been hostility. That's miraculous. Last week when Pastor Mike was leading us through the second half of chapter 2, it talked about that, that verse that some of us have heard, Jesus did this. Jesus made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. Jesus destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. That could also be translated as enmity. Not apathy, enmity for each other. We cannot underestimate what a big deal it was for these two ethnic groups to come together. And that's what the mystery is. The mystery revealed something that God knew all along. Way back when God spoke to Abraham and said, the nation of Israel will be a blessing to all nations. God knew that and revealed that and was opening up that revelation in a new way to these folks. And that was a huge deal. That now, God, back from the time of Abraham, has explained that God was serious. That Israel was to be a blessing to all nations. They form a new family, the family of God. That's what Pastor Mike talked about last week. Our identity, we have so many ways we might see ourselves and understand ourselves, and they're not all bad, but the reality is is our identity is first and foremost as children of God. That's who we are, and from there we understand the rest of ourselves and who we are. So first of all, the mystery of God reveals, then, if we're talking about this mystery, we see two things. First, God gives the identity, gives us the identity of a family brought together by Jesus. This is what the mystery of God is being revealed here in this chapter. The mystery of God, God gives us the identity of a family brought together by Jesus, as we talked about last week. But there's something more. 
There's something more in this passage, and it's a little bit hidden, so I want to bring it to the surface in the theme of bringing mysteries to the surface. I want to show one thing. Uh, in this passionate plea, when you look at, at these verses again, can you put those verses up for me again? Notice that underlined word, heirs. Heirs. The mystery is that the members together of one body, they, the, through the gospel, so the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. So not only does God give us an identity, this unity and diversity, which is a miracle, identity of the family of God, but God also has a purpose for this family. This is not just any old family. This is God's family. That little word heirs is what I would call kingdom language. It should be a clue that Paul is not just talking about one big happy family. This is going to be fun, family reunions. This is God's family. And this is a royal family. And Jesus, the true heir, is the king. The king of kings, we often say. This family is not just any old family. This is a family that has a lot of responsibility because this is a family that is representing the kingdom of God. Jesus is the heir to the throne, to the power, to the, to the kingship. Jesus is the heir, yet mysteriously, in ways that I still cannot fully grasp, Jesus decides to share that spot with us Jesus decides to say, we're going to be co-heirs, and you're welcome to join me, Israel, and you're welcome to join me, Gentiles, together on equal playing field that none of us deserve to be with Jesus, but you are going to be co-heirs of the promises that I have and of the kingdom of God and represent this kingdom. So secondly, secondly, the, the mystery of God revealed is that God gives us kingdom purpose together to join the restoration of the world that God loves. God gives us kingdom purpose. Do you see that? God gives us identity in the family of God and God gives us kingdom purpose to join in what God's doing in the world. A few weeks ago, we talked about power. Um, Ironically, while the power went out, if you don't know that story, ask somebody. It was bizarre. We're talking about power and how different the power is that Jesus is talking about and who Jesus is. It's upside down from the power of the kings and the, the rulers and the presidents in this world today. This is power that is, is, is love coming up under and serving and loving and hope and forgiveness. Jesus redefined what power looked like. That's the kind of king that Jesus is, and that's the kind of invitation to represent the king we're invited into. Paul says in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. It's hard to receive God's grace sometimes. Good thing that the power of the Holy Spirit helps us do that. That same power we talked about that raised Jesus from the dead is offered to us so that we can be empowered to receive our identity and purpose. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to receive that identity and that purpose because there is so many things coming at us telling us who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be about. But who does Jesus say we are? And what does Jesus invite us to be about? So there it is, the two things. The mystery of God revealed these two things. God gives us the identity of a family brought together by Jesus, and God gives us kingdom purpose together to show this love and join in the restoration of the world that God loves. So here's my my summary takeaway. We'll put it up on the screen. We are unified in our identity and empowered in our purpose to display the mystery of God's restorative love for the world. A Jesus-centered church is unified in our identity and empowered in our purpose to display the mystery of God's restorative love for the world. Following Jesus my whole life, it's still a mystery to me how God loves this world so deeply. I'm a a student of psychology, and I don't just mean like memes about mindfulness on Instagram um, or whatever. I, I have a degree in psychology. I love it. I think it's so interesting for us to think about. And there's a psychologist, one of the early psychologists, Alfred Adler, who famously said that humans are wired to have two deep desires in life, belonging and significance. Humans are wired to have two deep desires in life, belonging and significance. Who are my people and why does my life matter? I can resonate with those questions. Not all of Adler's conclusions in his life in the early 1900s are helpful. However, this one, I think, makes sense. We d- doesn't that go for just everybody, right? <laughs> like, not all of your conclusions are helpful. <laughs> Pastor Steph, that's okay. The desire we have for belonging and significance rings true to me as I look at our lives, as I look at my life. Who are my people and why does, why does my life matter? And I believe God wired us this way to desire these things. We desire belonging because the God invites us to belong in the family of God. 
God wired us and designed us to be people who want to be significant because God designed us to have purpose and significance in joining in this family that has a responsibility and a kingdom purpose. Do you see that in this point today? I'll put my my main point again. We are created for belonging and significance, for belonging and purpose. So I just want to pause for a second. I want to give you a a chance to just have a a quick audit of your life. We often do this at Mill City. Just say, let's, let's look at where we're at because then we know how to invite Jesus to, to lead us where we want to be. And so when it comes to these two areas of belonging and purpose, I want to invite you into asking this question. First, audit in your life. I mean, it can sound good hypothetically, but I want this to be practical. When we think about belonging, where are you at in your life? Do you feel a sense of belonging where you find yourself in your everyday life? God created us to experience a relationship of belonging with him, but also in community with other people. At Mill City, we sometimes say our up relationship with God and our in relationship with other people. God created us for those things. It's not always going well for most of us. That's okay, but where are you at? Just consider that for a minute. This doesn't happen by accident in our life. God wired us to desire it, but that means a pursuit on our part to pursue rhythms with God, and to pursue a relationship with other people and get connected. Second, when it comes to purpose in your life, where are you at? We sometimes at Mill City call this our outward-focused mission. The way we look beyond ourselves, our relationship with God, our relationship with community, and we look towards the world that God loves and we say, God, what are we doing? And how can we join into what you're doing? What are you doing in the world and how can we join in? And we always say here, that's about where you already are in your workplace, in your neighborhood, with your family? What is God doing there in your workplace, in your family? What would be one next step for you in this area? You could spend a lot more time thinking about this, right? I want to encourage you to do that, just to do an audit of these two things in your life and then to turn to God and say, what what do you want me to step into next? Because we've got to do it. We've got to take those steps in our relationship with Jesus, with other people, even though it's awkward sometimes, especially when you're getting to know new people. But the reality is, is that consistent Connection is what gives us community, right? And we got to be committed to that. We've got lots of ways we love to do that as a church. You can see them all over the website, but you got to go and you got to do it and you got to push past the awkwardness. Am I right? Amen? Awkwardness? Okay, that's not just me. I'm usually the awkward one, just to be clear. A Jesus centered church is unified in our identity and empowered in our purpose to display the mystery of God's restorative love for the world. I want to finish with a quick story. I think that God has, has given this church an opportunity to reflect God's love to the world, this mysterious love. And there's lots of ways that I see that Mill City has had a chance to do that. But I noticed one this week, and that was when I got a phone call from one of the reporters at the Northeaster, the local newspaper. And she said, I heard that Elam Church and Mill City Church might be having a merger. And I thought, oh no, this isn't for sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I just paused. And I realized that she was going to be persistent about this, and I knew why she was persistent. Look at these quick snapshots. I just did a quick search on the Northeaster website. Look at these snapshots of headlines from Mill City Church over the last few years. Mill City Commons, backyard, grand opening. We made a a water-friendly backyard. Uh, Every meal offers food through the pandemic. Mill City Church steps up to support the community as the pandemic continues. Hundreds of families flood Logan Park for Mill City Church and other Northeast churches hosting their first egg hunt post-COVID. All right, let's do the same thing for Elam Church. Look at this first one. Elam Church, 2016, to host Out in the Cold, filmed by J.D. O'Brien. I know that guy. We're married, okay? (laughs) Elam Church offers shelter, clothing, and dignity to those experiencing homelessness. Homeless ministry at Elam Church hosts those in need, you guys, for real, with no COVID outbreaks in a shelter. Elam Church hosts trunk or treat, includes food. Right now, learn Asian cooking at Hot Walk Academy at the Elam Church Commercial Kitchen. How cool is that? And so this, this woman says to us, can I interview you? I said, only if you interview Pastor Paul from Elam and me together. And we spent an hour and a half talking to her, and you should have watched. It was so awesome. She was like, what? (laughs) You could tell. She was just like, what is this? And she asked us all these questions about why these two churches would do this when it's not something they have to do. And, and, And Paul said, you know, it's about honor. We see God doing something at Mill City, and Elam wants to honor that. And I said, you know what, it's about family. Because even if this isn't what God's asking us to do, we're still going to be family, we're still going to partner together. That's not even a question. 
And then she finishes this conversation with us. It was so crazy. It was so interesting. Uh, and I could tell that she was just like, this is, this is different. You know what she said to us? She said, this is very interesting. <laughs> and she could have, I mean, obviously Minnesota interesting is not always good. So she's, but I think the body language suggests that she was kind of saying like, this is really mysterious. Why would you do that? It was just a crazy thing. And so as we were finishing this conversation, I felt like this is the mystery of God, isn't it? Right here for this woman to experience. And it was, she was wonderful. She was so gracious. I don't know when there's going to be an article about it, but she know what she said. The last thing she said, well, I look really, I look forward to seeing what happens. And Paul and I were like, boy, do we do too. Yes, we do too. We'd like to know. The mystery of God. We can, we follow a God who can be known but also a God who is so great that our finite minds could never fully comprehend all God has done, all God is doing, and all that God will do. Amen? Let's worship together.